to Hotel Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back to Hotel Bar Sessions. My name is Lee Johnson, and I am joined by my co-hosts, Rick Lee and Jason Reed, and today our very special guest, Benedetta Todaro. And we are talking finally about psychoanalysis. So take a seat on the couch, get comfortable. (laughs) We've got a lot to talk about today. (laughs) But before we do that, as is our custom, we're going to go around the horn here and get some drink orders and some rants and raves. So Jason, let me start with you. What are you drinking and what are you ranting or raving about? I'm going to have a PBR. (laughs) Classic. Uh, (laughs) Hipster doofus. (laughs) There's a reason, because tonight I'm having the release party for my book at Space Gallery. And Space Gallery is a great art space here in Portland. But back in their day, they started around the same time I moved to Portland. You could only get PBRs there. So in honor of Space Gallery, I'm having a PBR. And in honor of your book, which is called? The Double Shift, (laughs) when I was at Marks on the Politics of Work. And where can the people find it? At versobooks.com or where fine books are sold. (laughs) (laughs) Your local independent bookseller. So I am ranting today about Jordan Peterson. Peterson, not Peel. Let's clear that up right away. And I know in some sense, ranting about him goes without saying. Like there's almost an unstated rant about him in my day-to-day life. But he has recently gone, even for himself, off the deep end on Twitter, claiming that woke death should come for the Associated Press because the Associated Press ran a story about how New Jersey has reduced traffic death by limiting on-street parking. Apparently, that is woke, according (laughs) to Jordan Peterson. He also tweeted, lies, 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 at a UNESCO tweet that was encouraging women to take up careers in engineering and other STEM fields. So apparently, women engineers are also woke. So bizarre. And since he is a psychologist, all I want to say in closing is, psychologist, heal thyself. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Rick, what about you? What are you drinking and what are you ranting or raving about? Well, in honor of having Benedetta here, I will have a Negroni, please. I am ranting today about friend of the podcast, Ron DeSantis. (laughs) I don't know if you all have heard about this, but Florida is going through a major measles epidemic at the moment. Partly that's because of him and his policies, and partly it's because of the public health officials he has appointed. But people, we know how to deal with this. And Mm. DeSantis is writing emails to parents saying, oh, it's okay to bring your children to school even if they're unvaccinated. So I'm ranting about our old friend, Ron DeSantis. Today, we are joined, as Lee said, by Benedetta Todoro. Benedetta is an Italian psychologist with a psychoanalytic orientation, and she recently obtained a PhD in philosophy from Université Paris et Chrétien, and her PhD dissertation charted the emergence of anorexia nervosa in 20th century Western societies as a gender and culture-bound expression of female bodies radical and tragic subversion of patriarchy, body reification, and consumerism. She publishes and does research at the crossroads between French theory, psychoanalysis, and feminism. Currently, she's working toward reopening the debate between second and third waves of feminism and Marxist feminism around the opposition of symbolic body, material body. She's an adjunct lecturer at the Department of Psychology at the Université de Picardie Jules Verne in France, where she teaches epistemology, history of psychology, fundamentals of psychoanalysis, phenomenological theory, and Dasein Analyse. And she's also a practicing analyst. So, Benedetta, welcome. What are you drinking and are you ranting or raving? Thank you for welcoming me in this way. Very happy to be here. So what I'm drinking, well, I'm drinking a Malibu and pineapple cocktail, which seems very weird choice to you. So just to give a taste of what psychoanalysis is, I am considering this choice, why I want this now. (laughs) 
So my first association, because psychoanalysis works through free association of the mind, is to a first memory from a few weeks ago when I was planning a trip to the south of California with my husband. And I noticed that there is a town in California which is called Malibu. I didn't know that was the name of a <laughs> beach town in California. Then the second memory comes, which is about the fact that Malibu and pineapple was my teenager choice for drink. <laughs> <laughs> Malibu is a rum-based coconut spirit. We joined with pineapple juice while you can imagine how sweet it can taste. Yes, yes. So it's the perfect choice for someone who is not familiar at all with alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say that is also very woman's choice. Oh. I think at that time, I wanted to establish myself in a kind of gender choice. 15 years ago, I don't think boys would have ordered pineapple and Malibu cocktails. <laughs> well, this boy may have. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's changing today. So from my choice to choose to have a Malibu pineapple through the choice to be a woman, through a planned trip with my husband, maybe there's some space for psychoanalysis here. Cheers to you. <laughs> wow. I feel like we've just already been schooled. I know. <laughs> And are you ranting or raving? And what about? Today I'm raving about coming back to reading literature after the break that I take from it during my PhD writing. I was absolutely unable to read literature during my PhD program. And now I'm very happy to come back reading literature. So I have on my table... The Bluest Eyes by Toni Morrison, The Passion According to G oh. by Clarice Lispector, and I have The Adventure of Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Ah, uh, nice. Okay, Lee, what about you? What are you drinking and are you ranting or raving? I think I'm just going to have two fingers of Buffalo Trace today. And I'm ranting about people who want to have their cake and eat it too. <laughs> So there's this old saying that you can have two of the following three things. You can have it fast, cheap, or good. I think we all know this. <laughs> but I was recently watching a documentary on predators on dating sites. One of the things that people were complaining about was why these people on these sites can't just get banned. If people have reported that they've had problems with these men, because let's admit it, they were men, why aren't they just banned? Why can't they identify them? And I think what people who make this complaint seem to miss is that that would require losing a lot of privacy on these sites. And I do feel like this happens a lot when people complain about internet sites is that they want all the privacy until there's a problem, and then they want all of the disclosure. And you just can't have those things at the same time. So I think when it comes to the internet, you can have it cheap, private, or worth your time, but you can't have all three. <laughs> so Rick, I know we're talking about psychoanalysis today. How did you want to set this up? Let me at first disclose that I don't really know all that much about psychoanalysis. I read a couple of books in graduate school, <laughs> but almost from the beginning of its theoretical elaboration and also its clinical practice, psychoanalysis has without doubt had a profound impact on culture, particularly in the West. Like we all laugh at the idea that sometimes a cigar is just a cigar and we talk freely about Freudian slips. And many of us are at least passingly familiar with the main concepts, ego, id, repression, sublimation, and so on. Now, philosophy in particular has been in a fairly constant dialogue with Freud and psychoanalysis, some philosophers embracing it and using it to understand aspects of our moral, political, social, and cultural lives, and other people critiquing or even rejecting it. It seems that European philosophy and its heirs cannot get away from Freud and psychoanalysis. But what's the compulsion? Why have philosophers turned to psychoanalysis, but not to, for example, a psychological theory like behaviorism? Is the influence of psychoanalysis on philosophy a good thing? 
And are there not really terrible things about psychoanalysis, like that it simply helps bourgeois people adjust to their own alienation, (laughs) that it turns social and political issues into psychological ones, and that it's not necessarily liberating, but might instead be a penis? I am sorry, I mean reactionary. (laughs) So let's bring psychoanalysis on the couch, dig into its darkest recesses, understand its dreams, and see what's really going on. Benedetta, we often like to begin, especially when we're talking about something we don't know very much about, with a definition. So I know you could speak for hours about this, but just briefly, could you give us and the listeners a sense of what psychoanalysis is and maybe raise some of its main ideas and concepts? Sure, Rick. You already said something very interesting in your introduction. Oh, I'm already on the couch, people. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. It's actually a very important point, which is that psychoanalysis is both a practice, it's a procedure for investigated conscious and unconscious psychic processes. It's a technique, the therapeutic one, for the treatment of neurotic disorders. And it's also a theory. Mm -hmm. A series of psychological intuition acquired through the practice, which at certain point converged together and became a new discipline, what we call today psychoanalysis or psychoanalytic theory. And this theory, as you said, became extremely used in diverse spheres of reality, art, culture, society, and etc., Also, psychoanalysis has now quite a long history. Not so long history as philosophy, but we are still talking about something which has been around for 130 years. The founder of psychoanalysis is Sigmund Freud, who is a Jewish-Austrian neurologist that founded psychoanalysis at the end of 19th century. Many authors came after Freud, so the discipline has changed a bit. But there are some invariant aspects, I would say, both in the practice, in the theory, and in the technique. I would say there are two main hypotheses. The first one is about the existence of the unconscious, Uh. and it's probably the main and the most important thing in psychoanalysis which is basically the idea that psychic activity is not limited to the sphere of the consciousness. On the contrary, there is an unconscious sphere, not directly cognizable, that determines the greater part of our psychic activity and behavior. So when I do something, when I think something, I am governed by an agent in my mind that doesn't allow me to be completely aware of what I'm doing and say. This is the main idea. And the second idea is that there is a kind of psychic determinism. In the mind, nothing happens by chance. Oh. Every psychic event has its own reason, which can be reconstructed by the psychoanalytic method. So I would say that these are the two main hypotheses of psychoanalysis. But maybe the most no aspect of the theory is that there is a specific structure of our psyche organized in three agents, the head, the ego, and the superego, as you said. Before you explain those three agents, can I ask you a question? This is something I've always really wondered. Can you explain the unity of those three agents in consciousness? Because I do feel like a lot of people talk about the id, the ego, and the superego as if we have three entirely distinct consciousnesses in one mind that are battling with one another or correcting one another or whatever. That has always seemed odd and just intuitively untrue to me because you called them three different agents. I would say that, at least in Freud, these agents are not established once for all, but they are in a dynamical relationship to each other. The separation between the three agents is a little bit blurred. 
And this is what's very interesting in psychoanalysis, is that there is never a complete separation of these agents. So the structuration of the mind is always going on. Mm. This is the idea that there are dynamics that move inside the psyche. I would suggest that someone like Jacques Lacan, who is a French psychoanalyst, has a more structural Mm. model of the psyche, which is less dynamics and less interesting to understand the change that the psyche go through during a life period. Mm. I'm glad you brought up the unconscious as being part of the discovery because, well, two things. One is, Obviously, that's a huge blow to philosophy, which begins with the premise, or doesn't begin with the premise, but is often associated with the premise that we know ourselves, you know, the cogito, the idea that we're aware of ourselves, and that's a basis for future knowledge. It's interesting to think about that as discovery, but also one that has both a negative and a constructive element. Freud himself sometimes talked about how it was a huge blow to the narcissism of humanity. He compared it to Copernicus discovering that we're not the center of the universe and Darwin discovering we're not the end-all and be-all of life on this planet. I guess there's both the unconscious, which I think is hard to argue against. It's hard to claim that people have total awareness of what's going on with them. But then there is, as we've been discussing, the concepts created on top of that. And I think that for me, coming from philosophy, there's always a relationship between what psychoanalysis destroyed and what psychoanalysis created. Like, I would never want to argue against the reality of the unconscious, but I might have some issues with some of the theoretical constructions on top of that. Yeah, I think that radical constructivists may wonder if the creation of a method to study an object is not the creation of the object itself. Mm -hmm. So can Mm -hmm. we ask if the unconscious was created by Freud by creating psychoanalysis? That's Mm -hmm. a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is that I don't think he discovered the unconscious. I think he made the hypothesis of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. What Freud did at that point is comparable to what Schrodinger was doing at the same time in physics about the principle of indetermination, that the existence or maybe the nature of the unconscious is that of being hypothetical. Mm. This is for me the great point in Freud and the reason why it was so interesting for postmodern philosophers. Saying that the existence of the nature of the unconscious is hypothetical is saying both that it will never come to a full presence, in this sense is non-phenomenological, and it will never come to a synthetic moment with the conscious part of the mind. So it's non-dialectical. And I think that these two elements made the hypothesis of the unconscious very interesting for postmodern philosophers. The frustration, the theory of the unconscious brought to humankind, I mean, the awareness that I am not the sovereign subject, Mm. was connected by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur to Nietzsche and Marx, Mm -hmm. And he called Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud the master of suspicion. Right. And I recently read an article, a wonderful article by the Canadian psychoanalyst Willie Apollon saying that postmodern philosophers were so deeply interested into Freud because he was the first of the postmoderns. So for my brother-in-law, Dave, let me just clarify two points you made. One is that when you say that something is not phenomenological, phenomenology is a wide-ranging and important movement in philosophy, but we could say in general that it's the study of what appears to us and how it appears. And so if something is non-phenomenological, that means that it doesn't appear to us. And so the unconscious certainly is something that doesn't stand up and say, hey, here I am. Or to borrow on a conversation we've had in the past, it's not like a table or a chair, (laughs) 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 which as we all know, are the really real things. (laughs) And then just secondly, quickly, you use the word postmodern. 
this also is something that has a fairly ambiguous meaning, and it means different things in different branches. Architecture has a postmodern movement, and literature has a postmodern movement. But I think what we mean about it in philosophy is that it comes after what we call the modern period, which would begin roughly with Descartes, and it in many ways is a criticism of that and all that comes along with it, namely the transparency of the self to itself, the transparency of knowledge, dropping the quest for certitude. And the human consciousness, as as Benedetta said, a sovereign subject. Oh, yeah. That's probably one of the most important. Transparent to itself. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So that being said, I know we want to come back and talk briefly about ego, id, and superego, but can I just pull out this suspicion moment? Because one of my, I don't know, criticisms of psychoanalysis is that once the hypothesis of the unconscious is on the table, then it seems to me the claim is that the analyst has access to more of me than I have access to myself. And then I'm worried about a kind of constructivist project. Namely, is the analyst putting those things there or are they really there? Freud might be suspicious, but the reason it raises suspicion in me is because of this lack of transparency to me, but someone else has access to it. Right. So I think this opened the question of a certain relationship of power yeah. in psychoanalysis. So first things I want to say is that psychoanalytic relationship, I mean the relationship between the analyst and the patient, or in Lacan's word, the relationship between the analyst and the analysant, it's an asymmetric relationship, okay? We can think about Foucault here and say that just having knowledge means having power. Right. And this is not erasable. We cannot erase this difference of power in the analytic relationship. Right. Is this power used in the service of the unconscious or the unconscious is made at the service of this power. Yeah. Which means what kind of posture the analyst is going to take toward the patient. I would say there are two main different posture, the Freudian one and the Lacanian one. The Freudian one is about neutrality. The analyst try to open a space of free speech for the patient where he learns to manage the time of the session to say something he wants to say about himself, or he tries to resist to what he doesn't want to say. Mm. The Lacanian version is more complicated and for me more dangerous because Lacan say that the patient should put the analyst in the position of the subject supposed to know. So the idea is that the patient should access his own knowledge about himself Supposing that the analysts know it, mm. know about the patient. And this for me, even if I can say this is just the beginning of analysis, I think it's a quite dangerous situation because this guy in front of me has a lot of power because he knows a lot about me. And I should be interested in the knowledge that the other has about me. So I think that your fear can be understandable. But what I want to say is that they don't know anything about you. They <laughs> want you <laughs> to suppose them to know. So you're always free to say that they are wrong. That's my version. While we're on the topic of this therapeutic setting, I'm wondering if maybe you could explain to me the difference between the relationship between the analyst and the analyst and and just our normal everyday relationships with one another. So I also am somewhat suspicious of the psychoanalytic model and even its therapeutic value for some of the reasons that you just pointed out. However, I'm completely willing to stipulate that it is the case often that in interacting with other people, we come to know things about ourselves that was not already evident to ourselves. There is a way in which we could say, well, we're all just by interacting with one another in some kind of therapeutic relationship with one another. And the problem is 
the analysis part of it. The problem is the power dynamic that one person is an analyst and the other person is an analyst and is being analyzed, which is not our normal social interaction. Right. Okay, this opened a question about transference and counter-transference. So the relationship to an analyst is different from the relationship we have with other people outside the analyst office because when I speak to someone outside in the real life, this person will respond to me starting from his unconscious life. All the job for an analyst is trying to not respond to the patient starting from his own unconscious. Hmm. So the idea is that the patient get into the relationship with the analyst, putting the analyst in a specific position, which is an identity position, which is similar to the position he has experienced in the relationship with significant other in his life. Mm -hmm. This relationship, this transfer, is called psychoanalytic transference from the patient to the analyst. The analyst responds to this transference, trying to erase his own unconscious from the response. Mm -hmm. I want to make an example. Maybe it's going to be easier like that. A patient recently started a session saying that he feels stuck, that nothing is moving for him, and that he's not progressing. He feels that he can't help himself, that he needs someone to give him a recipe to treat his problem. He also asked me if I have already treated patients like him. I start to feel very uncomfortable about this request because I have been used to take the position of caregiver in my family for my whole life. And this is maybe a reason why I've done this professional caregiver job. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel very uncomfortable, but I cannot say to my patient that I am not comfortable because I feel that I cannot take care of him. So I step back, I analyze my counter transference to the patient. And so I made this simple statement. You want me to treat you as untreatable. Oh. So what are you and I supposed to do here? This is a way of hiding because I have analyzed my unconscious response to the transfer of the patient and provide an interpretation of his own transfer. So this makes it sound as if when you as the analyst are in a session with an analyst and or a patient, you're constantly going through a self-analysis in order then to be an appropriate analyst for the patient. Yeah, it looks like that, but in truth, it's much easier than that because, <laughs> you know, I have a little life, very insignificant. So I don't react to every element of the life of my patient. Some of them are significant to me, but there are other, many other experiences of life in my patients I don't have strong personal reaction to. Right. But mm. it is true that a constant movement of self-analysis is necessary to do this job, which is also connected to the fact that a analyst must have undergone a very, very strong analysis to be able to do this job. I just got to say, I'm not sure that I trust that model because, <laughs> I mean, I don't see how it's any different than a physician, a medical doctor treating me and claiming that he is going to be aware of prejudices that he has. Why should I be any more confident that a psychoanalyst is able to do that than a regular physician? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> or a philosophy professor, for that matter. Right. <laughs> well, don't psychoanalysts make understanding their own reaction to things more central than a philosophy professor might or a doctor? Like a doctor might think about their biases some of the time, but mainly they think about medicine, whereas part of the psychoanalytic idea is that they're always thinking about their own participation in this relation. Right. But, I mean, there's a paradox here, obviously, because if I say... I'm going to make central the things that are unconscious to me, the things that I do not understand about myself. I'm not sure that 
I mean, by definition, that they become more transparent to me. They become objects of my analysis mm. or even my attention or awareness. There's a kind of Aristotelian third man problem here, right? So that in order for me to analyze this patient, I need to have an analyst behind me. And in order for that <laughs> analyst behind me to analyze me, they must have an analyst behind them and so on to infinity. It's analysts all the way down. <laughs> yeah, that's very good because, you know... We call Freud dad between. <laughs> <laughs> so we all think that we should have been analyzed by dad, <laughs> meaning by Freud. It's true. Every analyst has an analyst. So a good analyst was been working through himself for a long time in a good way. There is no certitude about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he's supposed to do that. He's supposed to be able to put apart the side of his unconscious structuration. Of course, this doesn't happen every time. Does it happen most of the time, though? Because it seems to me that it would be rare and accidental when it does happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's also that this has changed a lot in the history of psychoanalysis. Relational psychoanalysis is much more aware of what's going on in the mind of the analyst. And there are some version of it for example, Sandor Ferenczi thought that the association of the analysis should be used in the session, mm. which means that they should be part of the analytic work. So I would not go disclosing my own unconscious to the patient, but somehow, somewhere, some little intervention about the analyst are not necessarily wrong in the relationship with the patient. You know what would really suck right now? A commercial. Imagine the witty and entertaining philosophical banter being interrupted with an ad from MailChimp. Terrible. You can help us keep ad-free and free by supporting us with a donation. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash hotelbarsessions, where you can sign up to make a monthly donation at several different levels. Or if you prefer a one-time donation, or to make sporadic gifts when you're able, just visit our website, hotelbarpodcast.com. You can find links to support the podcast through Venmo, PayPal, or Cash App. Now back to the interesting stuff. I think we have a good idea of what the practice of psychoanalysis looks like. And I want to really thank you for that because I was once in analysis years and years ago, but it was only one day, one session. And so it's nice to see what it might look like in practice. But I'm not quite clear from just what the practice is, why that has such an impact on philosophers, particularly in the 20th century and particularly French and German philosophers. I mean, you started out talking about this issue of suspicion that Paul Ricoeur raises, but I'm wondering, like, the model of the relationship between what I'm conscious of and what I am not conscious of, what particularly is compelling about that? I'll admit I'm going into this with a kind of presupposition which might be wrong, and that is that whatever I'm not conscious of, some part of me is actively repressing. That is, I'm keeping a part of myself from myself. And so I'm just wondering, why is that appealing to philosophers? And do I have that right model, that it's all repression? I would say that the reason why philosophers, and especially 20th century philosophers, are so interested in psychoanalysis is that the individual structure of the psyche is structured by three agents, id, ego, and superego. And I think this is a very important aspect, which is not taken into account by other orientation of psychology. Mm. And this mm. is maybe the reason why psychoanalysis is so compelling to philosophy. What I mean by that is the model of the psyche in psychoanalysis is an evolutionary one. The baby comes into the world and the structuration of the psyche is to be done. And this structuration is the result of the contact with social rules, which are given to the baby through primary relationship, which means family relationship, and then the relationship with the whole social system. 
Mm -hmm. So what is very interesting in psychoanalysis is that the establishment of this agent and their function in the psyche is connected to society and in Freud especially with the history of civilization. Mm -hmm. Basically, the idea is that when the baby comes into the world, is under the power of the id. The id is completely unconscious and is the primitive and impulsive part of our psyche, driven by instincts and desire. Mm. So when the baby comes into the world, it's this erogenous body that wants to satisfy its pulsion and its desires. Mm. But then the content with social rules allow the emergence of the ego. The ego is the mediator between the urges coming from the id and the rules imposed by the principle of reality. Mm -hmm. So the principle of reality is basically what we need to live in a society. And then there is a third agent, the superego, which is a kind of authoritarian agent who tries to make the ego behave properly, which means <laughs> according to social rules, and try to limit the temptation of the ego to follow the id and mm. to satisfy the unspeakable desire pushing from the id. This structuration of the psyche in three agents, as I said, is part of the individual history of every person, but also part of the history of humankind following Freud. So in some texts like Totem et Tabu or Civilization and its discontent, Freud show how the history of a singular is also the history of the humankind and the way in which the individual psyche is connected to the establishment of a civilization. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about really the question about the relationship between the individual and society. And of course, this is a question that's not alien to philosophy. We have lots of different takes on does a society repress the individual? Does the individual express their natural sociability through society and so on? But it also makes me think that now we're also talking about the way in which psychoanalysis is a practice, but its practice was never separated, especially in Freud, from what is often called metapsychology, right? Freud writing things like civilization is discontent, sort of reflecting on the general human condition. And I'm really wondering, what is the current discussion in psychoanalysis about the relationship between the practice and the more meta theory about humanity, society, repression, etc.? Hmm. There's a strong debate between those who are psychoanalysts, meaning those who practice psychoanalysis, and theorists of psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. especially philosophers. Mm -hmm. And psychoanalysts argue that everything Freud wrote, the whole theory built, is the result of his clinical practice. And so in a sense that theory is just a retranscription of what happened in the practice. Philosophers and theorists of psychoanalysis think that it's possible to build a psychoanalytic theory beyond the fact of practice in psychoanalysis. I will say that both these positions are kind of wrong mm. in a sense <laughs> that on one side, psychoanalysts forget that they use a technique and a technique is the encounter between a practice and a theory. Mm -hmm. A technique is what is transmitted from a practitioner to another and contains both elements of a theory and element of the practice. And then philosophers also sometimes forget that there is no pure theory. And this is maybe another thing that psychoanalysis can bring into discussion, which is the relationship between theory and practice in philosophy. Mm -hmm. In psychoanalysis, we are very comfortable saying that different techniques means different relationship between theory and practice. I would like to ask the question to philosophy if we can say that different theory in philosophy are also different way of practicing philosophy. Mm. It's a question that psychoanalysis being established as practice and theory can ask to philosophy. 
going back to this Masters of Suspicion thing, you know, it's worth pointing out that Freud and Marx were coming to this point of suspicion by engaging with a different kind of intellectual practice. Psychoanalysis, it's, it's analysis. Marx, it's the reading of history and political economy. I mean, Nietzsche can claim that too, and people have claimed that, that philology plays the same role in his interest in language, that to some extent their transformation of philosophy is predicated, as you said, on a different practice of philosophy, reading different texts, engaging with different types of questions. And I do think that the question of practice it is a philosophical question as well, that philosophers practice philosophy in different ways, and we need to be attentive to the differences of the practice as much as we are attentive to the statements and proclamations, that different proclamations and statements come out of different practices. I want to return, Benedetta, back to something you said about the structuration, and this, in a way, maybe follows from Jason's question. You said that it's a response or in conjunction with society and therefore also history, the history of the individual, the history of a society, and so on. Now, earlier, you seem to say that psychoanalysis is not dialectical. And so I'm wondering the structuration of the individual psyche in relation to society, is that not dialectical? And I'll tell you why I'm asking this question, because one of my own criticisms of psychoanalysis is that it turns social and political questions into psychological questions, and in so doing, makes it the individual's responsibility. And so any problem I'm having, maybe the word is neurosis, I don't want to use that word in the wrong way, but any problem I'm having, it's not a problem with the world, it's a problem with me, or a problem in my relating to the world. Yeah, I can answer this question looking at what is the account of society in psychoanalysis. Of course, different psychoanalysts has different account of the importance that has to be given to social elements in the analysis. For example, for Jacques Lacan, French psychoanalyst, society is a way to deviate the good and the original desire of the individual. And so he suggested that analysis pushed the person toward a decollectivized speech, which means the person should get in touch with his own individual desire beyond any social construction of the desire itself. I absolutely disagree with this position. Good. Because my position is that desire is always already social constructed. So for me, the question is more why this specific individual is subjected to this specific social construction of desire. I do think that society provides very broad range of possibility of construction of desire. And what interests me deeply is how every person has picked up that specific construction of desire, which is offered by society in a historical moment, in a geographic position. A second part of the answer could be about how psychoanalysis can be a liberatory practice. Mm. There are a lot of debate on this topic about whether psychoanalysis make people more coherent with the values of this society or make people willing to liberate from social schema and social injunction. Psychoanalysis, in my opinion, can be liberatory, but the nature of this liberation is not social or political. It's individual. I would say that some version of psychoanalysis could be even working against the construction of a collective speech that is what is needed for social revolution. On the other side, the movement of liberation of the subject from some social oppressing schema can be shared in a society and create a kind of contagion effort that can help other people ask themselves if they are not subjected to oppression and build a common sense of revolution. So it seems to me at first there is a distinction you want to hold on to between the liberation of an individual from social repression or the demands that society places on the individual, but that's an individual liberation and is in no way collective. 
But then secondly, and maybe differently and separately, there is the ability of, for example, a liberated individual to now come into solidarity with other liberated individuals or come into solidarity such that they can show other individuals first that society is repressing us and second what we might be able to do about it. Did I understand you right that there is this necessarily first step that would be the liberation of the individual and then a second step, namely that that could become, I like your word here, contagious? Yes. So I have an example. Maybe an example can be easier to understand. I have a lot of patients who are women and the liberation of the speech which happens in a session allow them to say, for example, what they like sexually. And what they like sexually sometimes is absolutely not coherent with the imaginary about sexuality which is around them in society. So when they start talking about their own sexuality, freely meaning saying really what they like, this creates a kind of contagious effect when women then start talking between each other about those aspects. This happened recently to me with a patient who, after talking with me about what she liked sexually, she opened up this discussion with a talking group with some women friends. And so they started to understand that they knew they have always known what they liked, but they always thought the way they liked it or the reason they liked it was essentially wrong. There is a condition for this to happen. The analyst should be able to put aside a little bit of the traditional theory which has been established about sexuality in psychoanalysis. I want to make a very short example of a recent supervision group I am in. In this supervision group with very old psychoanalysts, of course, they are all men. I am the only woman of the supervision group. One of them started the presentation of a clinical case, a woman. The patient say she's only capable of a little clitoral orgasm. The goal of sexuality in psychoanalysis is reproductive heterosexual penetrative sex. Mm. This is the final goal following the theory of psychoanalysis. This kind of sexuality excludes the clitoral pleasure of women. So many women still believe that they should have orgasm from the inside of their sex and that clitoral pleasure is something which is, if not wrong, not enough. Mm to accomplish a sexual act. So when a woman in a session say that she likes that kind of pleasure, a, let's say, traditional analyst correspond saying that she's not able to get the real pleasure. Mm -hmm. So the condition of the liberation of people doing analysis has to be provided by an open mind analyst, an analyst that is able to deconstruct the foundation of the theory of psychoanalysis, especially about sexuality. So I'm going to ask a question that I absolutely am 100% positive some listeners are having in their mind right now, which is, yes, that's a very good example of a repressed pleasure that has been socially imposed and that were it the case that the analysts collectively, let's say, could open their minds more about it. We could have more liberated individual women who then contagiously would make a more liberated sexual society. That's a good example. Now, replace the woman with a pedophile. Hmm. Okay, right. <laughs> <laughs> Let the record show that Benedetta was speechless for a moment. Right. It's interesting because I was part of a group in Paris last year, a group of psychoanalysts. So the name of the group was New Perversions. Mm. Some of them suggested that someone whose perversion is giving oral pleasure to a woman should not be considered as perverse. I don't agree with that. 
I don't want my sex to be used as an object. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I just want to make sure that I understand what you're saying here. You do not agree that oral sex for women should be a perversion? You think it should be a perversion? <laughs> no. Okay. Is that what everybody else heard? Yeah. What I heard was that if I, as a man, report that I take pleasure in providing oral sex to a partner who is a woman, that that is a perversion for me. Yeah. Okay. But we all agree that we all do not think that oral sex for women should be considered a perversion. No, it should not be. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm done here, folks. Thank you. <laughs> it's not too complicated an example. It's literally not too complicated an example. I think I just misheard your actual claim. No, please, yeah. let's go with this example. This is an important point. We need to do this for the people. Well, the next thing I understood was as long as that is considered a perversion, women's genitalia becomes an object. And therefore, the insistence that it is not a perversion also de-objectifies women's genitalia. No, it's not that. No? <laughs> it's much more complex than that. What I wanted to say is let's imagine that someone has a specific kind of perversion that he has to do oral sex to a woman to have pleasure. That is, this is his condition to have pleasure, mm. which means I'm not having pleasure because the other is having pleasure, by oral sex, but I am having pleasure just because I need to do that right. for myself, exclusively for myself. Right, okay. This means that I am using the body of the other and especially the genitals of the other as an object for my own pleasure. Mm. This is what perversion is. So some people can be perverse by doing oral sex. Of course, this is not always the case or a sex can also be the case of giving pleasure to the other because we like the pleasure of the other and we want the other to have pleasure. So the question in the seminars was, should we consider this person as perverse? Should we treat that case as perversion? Right. My response to this is that every time I'm using the other as an object, we should go through a treatment that treating the other as an object for one's own pleasure is something that is not right for the other. Of course, the question of pedophilia is the extreme question. I think that every analyst has to make some ethical choices. I have personally worked for three years in a service for children, a public service for children in France, and I mainly have to deal with abused children. Mm. So my personal ethical line is I think that I will not be able to work with someone having aggressed sexually children. Mm -hmm. So I know that what I'm saying is unpopular. We're not supposed to have this kind of ethical lines. We are supposed to accept every kind of human possibility without judging it. Mm. I'm not sure this is the right path for psychoanalysis. What I always say to my students in psychology is that you have to know which kind of patient you cannot work with. My problem is given that psychoanalytic theory is not a moral theory, and as far as I understand, doesn't even include a moral theory, right. I'm not sure that I entirely understand theoretically what the difference is between liberating any one desire and any other desire. Right. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I think that there are two versions of it. Again, Lacanian position is let's free all kind of desires. Mm. Freudian version is the goal is to build a society. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to structure individual desires in order to make society possible. That's why I like much more Freudian theory. So Freud becomes kind of extreme on this. We know that he ended his life in complete sexual sublimation, which means he stayed apart from any sexual activity. But I think there is a middle ground between Lacanian and Freudian position, which is liberating one's own desire, but the person has to have a responsibility for that desire. And that responsibility comes from the contact with the other and the respect for the other desire. 
So it's a complicated balance. Here at the hotel bar, Rick, Jason, and I like to pour philosophy straight into your ears. We're an independent and ad-free podcast, and we'd like to keep it that way. But the only way we can do that is with listener support. You can help us defray some of our production costs by signing up to support us on Patreon at patreon.com backslash hotel bar sessions. There are several levels of monthly donations there that you can sign up for, and every one of them helps us keep raising our glasses to deep conversations. If you'd prefer to make a one-time donation or several one-time donations, just visit our website at hotelbarpodcast.com where you can find links to support the podcast through Venmo, PayPal, or Cash App, and you can keep enjoying our tipsy philosophy and sobering insights. If I could switch gears for a moment or switch directions entirely, I once had a therapist who, when I mentioned psychoanalysis to her, laughed and she said, oh, that's so silly. And I said, what do you mean it's so silly? And she said, well, there have been no studies that have shown that it is effective in any way, shape or form. This is why psychology has left it behind, and I think she's right that in the U.S. at least, in most psychology departments, psychoanalysis is not really taught very much anymore. And so I'm wondering for you as both a theorist and a practicing analyst, first, is she right that it hasn't been proven to be effective? And secondly, if that is right— Is there still some usefulness you see in continuing the practice of psychoanalysis? I think that psychoanalysts should simply assume that it's not a scientific practice. (laughs) That it's about humans and it's not about data, it's not about calculation. It's a practice that takes place between two people. Is it effective? I am sure it is. I just think that we don't have the way to measure it in the way that measuring is done in our society, Mm. which is through calculation, data, and things like that. I personally like the position of outsider that psychoanalysis as compared to other psychological orientation, which I think suffer a bit of a inferiority complex facing (laughs) our sciences. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I also think that, for example, Lacan is a little bit also showing this inferiority complex when he tries to mathematize mm. with the formulas <laughs> of sexuation what is sexuality for men and women. So we should think about the encounter between psychoanalysis and structuralism, maybe as like in Marxism, the inferiority complex hypothesis is valid. Mm. But this is for another podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I am personally and professionally more concerned about the domination of those orientations of psychology that pretend to fulfill the requirements of the scientific paradigm. Mm. In my opinion, behaviorism, cognitive behaviorism, brief strategic therapy, and all those forms of therapy, coaching, goal focus intervention, went from Chicago to Palo Alto and landed directly in Cupertino. <laughs> the goal, <laughs> I think that the goal is quite clear, is therapy and not analysis. It's about redressing behaviors, correcting cognitive bias, is an orthopedic intervention. I use Michel Foucault's expression on this, and it's probably a generalization, but all these orientations of psychology are approaches that have largely supported the reduction of the singularity of a subject to the particularities of a consumer formatted for the needs of market economy. Mm-hmm. So, If there is a future for psychoanalysis is to oppose this kind of tendency to make people just productive subject that our economical system needs to function. Mm. Mm. Amen. 
get better so you could get back to the workplace. Yes. Well, unfortunately, our bartender is giving us last call. She's a little bit worried about what's going to happen if we get too liberated. So, <laughs> <laughs> so no more, no more libations for us. Before we get out of here, we didn't really talk about Freudian slips and those kinds of things, but I do want to say at the very beginning of this episode when Rick was introducing you, when he said Dasein on a Lisa, I definitely heard Dasein on a leash, and I think that maybe I need to talk to a therapist about this. <laughs> <laughs> but Benedetta, I really want to thank you so much for joining us. This has been really educational for me personally. So thank you so much. I do want to say something. Yeah. I think that somehow we have talked a lot about desire and sexuality. There is also another side of psychoanalysis, which is about suffering and trauma. Yeah. We haven't touched these topics, but there are experiences of abandon, rejection, violence, that are very often situated, in my opinion, between the individual and the social. Yeah. And these are also part of psychoanalysis. And it's important to me to add that there is another side of it. Well, our psychoanalytic hour has <laughs> come to an end. Insurance is not paying for any more conversation. <laughs> Podcast terminated. <laughs> I don't know that I'm any closer to getting on an analyst couch anytime soon, but again, I want to thank you for taking us to school and maybe even analyzing us a little bit. <laughs> thank you to you for inviting me. All right. Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. Bye.